Okay, so uh, learning outcomes. Now the topic given to me is drugs in osteoarthritis other than NSAIDs. So is it a drug or is it a nutraceutical? That's the first part we will look at. Is it a substitute for NSAIDs? How do they work? What stage of osteoarthritis are they effective, if at all? What is the clinical evidence? And is the cost justified? That's important. So what's a nutraceutical? Nutraceutical is any substance that is a food or part of a food that provides medical or health benefits in prevention and treatment of a disease. So it's basically concerned, uh, it fills that gap beyond the diet but before the drug. So then what's the drug? A drug, the word comes from a French word, means dry herb. That means basically plant source. It is other than food. So unlike a nutraceutical, it is used for prevention, diagnosis, treatment of abnormal conditions or disease. And most important, it has to be recognized by an official pharmacopoeia or a formulary. So now that we know the distinction, and we know the Indian nutraceutical market is just booming, and you can tell by the number of MRs outside your clinics and in the hospitals and the kind of pro products are which are being pushed to you. So now that I'm following the rheumatologist, please forgive me if I sound like one for a few slides, but uh, this is important. So what is the basic pathophysiology of osteoarthritis? This is important because as far as the orthopedic surgeon, my image of ortho osteoarthritis was wear and tear. You give glucosamine, Glucosamine goes into the joint, the joint starts producing new cartilage and that's it. So great, you keep, have, keep pumping glucosamine into the patient. But now we know the disease process a little more in detail. So this is what is basically happening at the joint level, at the cartilage level and at the bone level. There is a constant anabolic catabolic balance which keeps our joints healthy even in a non-arthritic stage due to physical exertion, sports, any kind of uh, stress. So when this is tipped towards catabolism, so what does that mean? Chondrocyte destruction, and that tips a start of the cartilage matrix erosion. So that is what happens, and this is mediated via certain signaling agents known as cytokines, interleukins, and one of the biggest uh, culprits in this is something known as a matrix metalloprotease. Now why I'm throwing these words to you is because this, this is where these so-called drugs or pharmaceuticals work. So this starts a cascade, and this cascade is what progressively damages the chondrocytes and the uh, cartilage matrix as we know the structure. And those who don't know the structure, this is the structure of the articular cartilage. As you can see, this is an excellent diagram. In one diagram tells you the two, two extremes. As you can see here, let me just try and... Okay, so that's our normal cartilage. You see the plump hyaline cartilage with all those cells in the various zones, a nice thin synovial membrane, very calm subchondral bone, no osteoblastic, osteoclastic overactivity. And you see on the other side, completely destroyed hyaline cartilage, you see the fissuring, you see the destroyed chondrocytes, you see the thickened synovium with the active, activated macrophages, and there's a lot of stuff happening in the subchondral bone, there's a lot of bone turnover, osteophyte formation, cysts, which you all see on the x-rays. So this is the pathology we have to treat. So what are the treatment goals? Obviously, reduce pain and inflammation, alleviate stiffness, improve range of motion, try and reverse the cartilage degeneration. Now that is something where these drugs are kind of, we expect that to be happen. And let this cartilage regenerate. Can, that's what the patient asks you in the clinic. Will my cart can my reverse my disease? Sanual fluid should improve and eventually bone health. Sorry. Okay. But we have NSAIDs for that. So I missed the talk of Dr. Karkhanis in the morning. So why not? What's the problem with NSAIDs? NSAIDs are doing a great job. They reduce the pain, they do reduce the inflammation, but they do nothing to slow down or regress the arthritis process. Especially, we are talking about osteoarthritis, we are not talking about rheumatoid now. So, and sometimes, and you might have seen this in your patients, patients on NSAIDs, there is a tendency for increased cartilage wear after pain relief, what is known as overuse of the joints. And there is some possible down regulation of the chondrogenesis also with certain NSAIDs which has been described. 
and there are always the complications like GI, myocardial infarction, strokes, and certain contraindic contraindications like diabetes, CKD, and high blood pressure, where you cannot use these drugs. So broadly, these supplements, I'm not going to say drugs now, these supplements in osteoarthritis come under two categories. The large category is the so-called non-NSAID anti-inflammatory. So let's put it that way. So these are all anti-inflammatories having an antioxidant effect and there's a very large spectrum of these uh, medicines or uh, supplements available. I will just enumerate a few here which are what we commonly see in, on our, uh, the kind of products which are being shoved down our throat. So curcumin, fish oils, vitamin C, boswellia, and the second group is cartilage repair, alleged cartilage repair agents, glucosamine, chondroitin, with or without MSM, diacerin, and the big uh, kid on the block now is undenatured type 2 collagen, which we'll describe a little more in detail. So let's go through some of these common, commonly mentioned uh, agents. So curcumin, obviously, we eat a lot of turmeric, turmeric in our uh, Indian diet. It's from the ginger family. It's a very potent anti-inflammatory. It blocks cytokines and enzymes. That is the same enzymes which are si similarly blocked by diclofenac or ibuprofen. And it has been found that up to one gram a day if ingested. Now that means 500 milligram twice a day. Normally these are available as 500 milligram tablets. But the problem is if you see the combined prescriptions, uh, combined uh, composition of tablets which we are shown, you'll find curcumin maybe just 50 or 100 milligrams. That's not enough. So curcumin has to be in the right dose for its effect. It can cause gastric irritation and blood thinning. And then that other problem comes in how good or bad is the preparation. So nanoparticles is something which is the new way of administ administering curcumin so that is better absorbed. Another thing you'll commonly find on a, on a combo uh, drug is rosehip extract. Now what is rosehip extract? It is the seed pods from the wild roses. So it is very rich source of vitamin C as you can see. Inhibits, again, all these are the anti-inflammatories. It inhibits inflammatory proteins and enzymes, COX-1, COX-2. So again, but in very large doses, five grams per day in divided doses is the recommended dose for rosehip extract. The third supplement which is supposed to be good and as a general health uh, uh, nutrient is fish oil. Now the key here is fish oil is a, a large amount of fatty acids but the key ingredients are the two DHA and EPA. These are the essential fatty acids which are very important for our bodies. They need to be supplemented for immune system for reducing the inflammatory cytokines. So this fish oil is supposed to be a better supplement in rheumatoid patients. I, uh, we, uh, Balki can give us better information on that. So what are the sources? We keep hearing about salmon, tuna, sardines. Basically, these are cold water fish. They produce more fat in their bodies. And where does this uh, oil come from? It doesn't, the fish doesn't produce it itself. It picks it up from algae and plankton. So the basic source is a plant source. The fish just concentrate it. So can you have vegetarian? Your patient may ask you, can you get a vegetarian fish oil? Yes, you can. This is canola oil, flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, but they contain something called alpha linoleic acid. This alpha linoleic acid will have to be converted by your body into DHA and EPA. So it's, it is a fish oil, but it's not an omega-3. So that is the trick here. So what is the therapeutic dose? 2.6 grams of the essential fatty acid twice a day is the recommended dose, which does not come in the normal capsule. So that for Commercial available capsule, you have to have 10 capsules of fish oils to get this dose. Now comes the interesting part. This is a term which I did not know existed. Symptomatic slow-acting drugs for OA. So that is what these glucosamine and the whole group come under. Well, this is a little cluttered slide, but this is very important. Basically, these are glycosaminoglycans and amino sugars. They are absorbed through the small intestine. The bioavailability varies 5% of for HA and 45% for possibly glucosamine. They act on the cells in the joint. Glucosamine being a smaller molecule penetrates into the cells and modulates inflammatory cyto uh, factors. Whereas hyaluronic acid and chondroitin being larger molecules attached to membrane receptors and thereby 
have influence on the extracellular matrix degradation. So that justifies so the, they're best used in combination, but HA is best given intraarticular. So running through these agents, most of them have the same action. Important thing is glucosamine is from f shellfish, is from the chitin of the shellfish. So if your patient has allergy to uh, uh, fish products, do not give them to them. Aspergillus niger, niger is now being used to ferment corn and wheat to form a vegetarian source of glucosamine. Don't know how effective that is. It's supposed to slow cartilage degeneration, the same process as we discussed. A study in 2016 showed that sulfate is better than hydrochloride. It is as effective as celecoxib when used with chondroitin. And in 2021, the AOS, American Academy, changed their guidelines saying that it can be functional in patients with ONEs. What's the dose? 1500 milligrams per day in divided doses or a single dose. Chondroitin, again, essential part of articular cartilage. Shark is the best source of chondroitin. 800 to 1200 grams, uh, milligrams per day, usually best had with glucosamine. It can interact with warfarin and blood clotting and best avoided in pregnancies and breastfeeding. Diacerin came and went. Diacerin was a very popular drug. It's basically an oral anti-inflammatory and analgesic. Its action again is an anti-inflammatory. It does prevent extracellular matrix fragmentation. The dose initially was 50 milligrams once a day for two to four weeks. This is what all the MRs have told us as well. Watch for diarrhea and then you make it 50 milligrams twice a day. Best avoided in elderly patients. MSM, not very popular, basically a source of sulfur. It's added with chondroitin. It's supposed to help in the uh, integrity of uh, connective tissue. I'm going to spend a little time, just maybe a, more on collagen. So collagen is something which is very commonly seen nowadays. It, ha it is basically forms the structure of all connective tissue. It binds all these connective tissue in tendons, cartilages. They're different types, but type 2 is what makes up articular cartilage. You have two forms. The ones you see as powders available in, on Amazon and these kind of things is what is known as hydrolyzed collagen. The collagen has been broken down into its peptides. It's made into a powder form. You can mix it with water and drink it up. Not very specific because it's, it's been denatured. You can have up to 15 grams per day. Undenatured is what is the current popular product. Type 2 collagen for articular cartilage. It is not broken down as you can see that diagram. It is derived from chicken sternum cartilage. It is purely a non-vegetarian source, but not bovine. So hydrolyzed collagen peptides, not really important for osteoarthritis, more for skin, hair, nails, is supposed to be the anti-aging formula. It, it is sometimes suspected as a lifetime supplement. You can take it as a fountain of youth. But undenatured collagen type 2 is what we'll talk about. This is, in my opinion, and from whatever I have read, is the molecule that makes a difference in osteoarthritis. It has this triple helix structure, as you can see. It maintains the integrity, and it has certain antigenic epitopes, which plays a vital role in its, uh, on its action on the, on the joints, which we'll come to in the next slide. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. Maybe I was sleeping during the, when the medical reps were telling us about this. There's something called oral tolerance. When you have a small dose of a particular drug, it is exposed to your what is known as the GALT system, gut-associated lymphatic tissue, and that sets up, it can identify the harmless antigens from potentially harmful antigens. So this is what happens. This diagram gives you a better picture. As you can see here, the undenatured collagen enters the cells, is exposed to the Peyer's patches. The native T cells are converted into T regulatory cells, which enter the lymphatic system, go through the bloodstream, enter the joint and release these, IL-4, IL-10 and TGF. And that is what works on the, so even a 40 milligrams, 40 milligrams is the tablet strength is what acts on these joints. So it's not, it's not the undenatured collagen which is going and re reproducing your joint cartilage. And a lot of studies are there. Some say yes, some say no. This is one of the studies I found. This was a effic efficacy of undenatured collagen in ONE's review of literature. Eight RCTs were included, 243 patients, and they showed that uh, uh, UC2 has shown promise as a potent supplement in early OA management. Still a lot of study to be done. Just to conclude my lecture, I would like to uh, give a relevant uh, case. 
56 year old male heavily built right knee oa with valgus arthroscopic cleaning done to in 2018 recurrent bouts of synovitis and pain after that stiffness res restricted range of motion nsaids required for a prolonged period of time suggested i hope you're going to maintain the patient confidentiality for that yes okay <laughs> so sorry this was the arthroscopy picture as you can see this is a complete uh, uh, the tibial plateau is completely full thickness uh, wear and tear of the cartilage and that's the axis of the knee samir i'll have to disappoint you i know you. i know i know <laughs> so this is the supplement stack i gave this patient uc type 2 40 mg daily after dinner vitamin c rose hip extract 1000 mg twice daily fish oil 1400 mg twice daily fish oil not epa calcium and vitamin d curcumin 500 mg twice a day and no nsaids he is still in valgus as you can see that's the valgus that's the valgus <laughs> there is no synovitis episodes i have still avoided that distal femoral osteotomy range of motion is great excellent range of motion so you can say nanachi tang is doing great so what is the take home message take home message is we know the disease now and we know the cascade nsaids are still the first line treatment in the acute stage but with complications long term treatment needs controlling inflammation and preserving the rest and preserving or restoring the cartilage there are many nutrition supplements that show promise prescribe them wisely knowing the the actions but more studies are needed for better understanding thank you thanks ashish